So within this, within these frameworks, or within these paradigms of research interests, um, there's main focus areas have been looking at visual analysis of television news as well as emotional cognitive uh, processing of television news. Uh, within the domain of uh, social and psychological impacts of new technology, you've done a lot of really groundbreaking research um, on the concept of interactivity. In fact, in our field, in, our, in the field of communication, I don't think there's a single other scholar who's done more conceptual work on the importance of interactivity, and that's uh, one of the reasons why he is truly acclaimed in terms of the notion of interactivity and uh, new media. Uh, Eric has, um, you see his publishing record, um, it's uh, truly fantastic. Uh, it's published in a wide variety of interdisciplinary journals, as well as pretty much all the top journals in uh, mass communication. And he will also be quite prolific in terms of edited books. Uh, he has one, two, three, I've used at least three of those in my classes, you know that. And he has a, um, a source book of um, political communication, methods on political communication, um, co-editor with Lance Goldberg that's coming out. But today, um, uh, he's going to be talking about a recent project which has been getting a lot of uh, attention in both the popular as well as the academic press. Uh, this is to do with a recent book um, co-authored by Betsy Grape, also at the University of Indiana. And this is going to be about network news and visual training of elections. Later on today, he's going to be talking about interactivity that's going to be in my graduate seminar. Those of you who want to attend that, you're more than welcome to come to that as well. That's at 5 o'clock at the research center. So, without much further ado, thank you for being here. Well, thanks, Sri. You're, you're much too kind as usual. Um, but hopefully, I'll leave you with something interesting to think about. So, let's go to the next slide. I'm, I'm not used to having uh, someone help with the slides, so hopefully, this will make sense as well. This is uh, just a screen capture of the book um, and a listing of the chapters. And what we try to do is put in a social science framework how to measure and kind of assess uh, and think about some of the impact of visuals. And the measurement part is key because up until um, you know the last couple of years, there's been a lot of talk about news visuals, um, a lot of memorable moments in televised politics, but not a lot of work done on how you measure these things, quantify them, determine a proportion, and determine what's interesting about it. So what we did is we focused on, um, everybody's heard of the sound bite, we focused on the image bite. And so this is the length of time that the candidates shown but not necessarily heard from. Or not just candidates, but any figure or source that you see on the news. Uh, journals talk a lot, sources talk uh, increasingly um, less. We also have the idea of visual framing, which I'll get to. Um, facial displays are very important in nonverbal communication and therefore on television. And if you take the totality of graphication, um, who's allowed to speak first, uh, how uh, long stories are, the camera angles within stories, and the type of packages in which candidates and different um, candidacies are presented, we think you can reliably measure and uh, make a statement about visual bias. Uh, this is kind of what hidden blogs and you know, you get immediately taken to task on a partisan basis, but we think it holds up social scientifically. And then finally, you know, what does this have, what impact does this have on uh, public opinion? That's the visual influence part. So ultimately, it's an argument about taking television seriously, but meaning from a social science perspective. Let's just go forward. So um, the importance of visuals, you kind of have to step back a couple spaces to think about uh, what they represent and why we should treat them seriously on the news. They're often regarded as uh, wallpaper, you know, pretty images, or stage displays, but regardless of how aware we are of, of uh, image handling, placement, and um, uh, productions, they still have importance uh, psychologically to the viewer. And so the audience, um, you know, we can think of the audience as citizens, we can think of them as internet users, we can think of them as, as viewers. And visual uh, capacities and abilities are, are overlooked and underplayed and not talked about enough, I don't think, in communication research. So if you look into some of the evolutionary literature, it's very interesting. Uh, speech and language and everything we do in print. By the way, I'm an old print guy. I'm a, I started out as a newspaper reporter, so I like the word as much as anybody. It's a very recent development in human history. So there's debates about whether language goes back 50,000 years, maybe at the most 200,000 years. If you look back farther in evolution, visuals surely, surely preceded that, along with that, the development of the brain. So there's large sections of the brain.
brain devoted to visual processing. And therefore, it seems like visuals are easy, intuitive. We can remember them with uh, high accuracy and degree of recall. They don't take effort. And therefore, we make a case in the book that um, they're kind of devalued culturally because they don't require learning. And if everybody can do it, how can that be special? Anyway, we, we can't forget this when we, when we think about election coverage and what television news and, and for that matter, internet news, news does when it presents YouTube videos, how easy it is for the audience to understand and recognize it. So they're a leveling kind of phenomenon. There's been some interesting work done on visual knowledge. And the disparities that you see in um, education, sometimes gender, socioeconomic status, almost go away when you measure people's visual knowledge. There's a guy at Princeton doing this thing, Marcus Pryor, very interesting work. Anyway, leadership, <coughs> uh, going to a political sense, has a large nonverbal component. And that's true of, of, of humans as well as primates and in any um, kind of animal, social animal um, community. So, you know, there is, there are some evolutionary ties here. And a particularly interesting thing uh, about people <coughs> is that leaders tend to have an attention-binding quality. So we're concerned about what leaders are doing, not just political leaders, but okay, cultural leaders, economic leaders. They're constantly in the news. Why does news follow them? Why does our definitions of news have to do with important people and um, what they're doing? So the more attention you receive, oops, if you can go back on that one. The more attention you receive, uh, the more of a leader you might be. That's one way to index leadership. Who's paying attention to you? And certainly in, in presidential races, if you're not receiving media coverage and no one's showing up to your events, um, you're, you know, by definition, not important or not leading in the polls. Okay, another uh, reason why visuals are important is we're now in an HD, large screen, uh, high resolution, high fidelity era. Leaders are coming at us, uh, news visuals are coming at us from more perspectives, more angles, more um, devices than ever before, an increasing resolution in a larger size than ever before. So how many people here have at least a 40-inch flat screen at home now? For grad graders. <laughs> <laughs> how many people know somebody who has a 40-inch flat screen? I saw one in a bar once. Okay. How many people watch, uh, watch YouTube videos 12 inches from the screen? <laughs> <laughs> Say it's the equivalent. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, leaders and images of people getting um, more common, not less common. And then, as I mentioned before, they contribute to political learning. So now we can go to the next slide. And what we have um, is a, a classic case of um, learning uh, in, from an episode in the 1984 campaign when Leslie Stahl, who was uh, a White House correspondent at that time, did a what she thought was a hard-hitting piece about the Reagan campaign's manipulation of images to tell a story that was different from what her narrative was. Uh, and to tell a story that what was different from what the Reagan's actual policies were. And she thought she was going to be criticized. And um, Dick Durham, who at that point was uh, Deputy Chief of Staff, called her and thanked her for it. This was a five minute, 10 second report aired on National Network News. You rarely see these. Uh, and he thought it was the equivalent of an ad. And, he's, and she says, what are you talking about? It's critical the whole way through. She, and he says, you guys in television land just haven't figured it out. Uh, when the pictures are powerful and emotional, they override, if not completely, drown out the sound. I mean it. Nobody heard you. Well, that's almost true. The pictures, when they're uh, evocative and emotional, will get your attention. But they are remembered much better when there's a conflict between the what's being said versus what's being shown. So let me um, just show you what I mean here. back to when Dan Rather was a rather dapper young man. That was speaking the point. It's a problem we got any criticism of President Reagan to stick, but 150 Republican incumbents and 50 more would-be incumbents lined up on the south wall of the White House today for a chance to stick to Mr. Reagan's coattails. It was but one example of a presidency that projects a personality and image that, even in the view of harsh critics, is almost picture-perfect in its skillful use of touch. But in using the medium, what is the Reagan message? Does it distort the big picture of reality? Leslie Stahl has been looking into this. How does Ronald Reagan use television? Brilliant. He's been criticized. 
criticized as the rich man's president, but the TV pictures say it isn't so. At 73, Mr. Reagan could have an age problem, but the TV pictures say it isn't so. Americans want to feel proud of their country again and of their president, and the TV pictures say you can. The orchestration of television coverage absorbs the White House. Their goal? To emphasize the president's greatest asset, which as they'd say, is his personality. They provide pictures of him looking like a leader, confident with his Marlboro man walk, a good family man. They also aim to erase the negatives. Mr. Reagan tries to counter the memory of an unpopular issue with a carefully chosen backdrop that actually contradicts the president's policy. Okay, now, you can, you can sense the tone of this thing as she's trying to point out the hypocrisy, essentially, in his use, or his handler's use of uh, backdrops to make positive statements when uh, his policy isn't going that direction. In the meantime, if you turn the sound off, and in other words, you're kind of uh, looking at it the way the brain might, if there's a, conf a conflict of uh, the verbal and the visual, which there is in this case, this is basically what you're receiving. Trying to project that likable guy, and yet in the same interview, 
he's showing signs of evasion, doubt, in inability to articulate something. He wants to avoid the situation. Can anybody guess what that question was? This was late in the campaign, a few days before the election. The story broke, and they wanted him to comment on it. Bush's uh, DUI. Bush's DUI. Now, why would Gore be showing evasion uh, over the release of Bush's DUI? Wouldn't most candidates, if not seize on that, at least use the opportunity to talk about their platform and position? Instead, he acts a little embarrassed, or maybe, you know, why are you asking me if I had anything to do with it? I didn't have anything. But his manner is basically uh, eroding or undermining his uh, denial. So we can go forward. So there's, so in other words, there's information there to be had in the discrepancy between these two um, kind of displays. So anyway, I've done some research on this and experiments. And leader displays evoke all kinds of emotions, all kinds of evaluations, meaning uh, evaluations of leadership, competence, intelligence, uh, appropriateness. Gamut of things, truthfulness, honesty, etc. They may affect the viewer's attitude. Certainly, they affect viewer impressions and perceptions. If it's repeated, if it tends to be a tendency, or if it's like Howard Dean and you uh, have one 10 second episode that's repeated 500 times in three weeks, it'll have a lasting impression. Uh, and so, what, what's interesting from a visual point of view about this is that <coughs> these uh, impressions, these effects, occur whether the leader's voice is heard or not. And so there's another uh, huge round of criticism about the anchors and the reporters talking over the candidates. Okay, that's legitimate criticism, but that doesn't mean the viewer's not getting any information. The viewer still gets the visual. And my argument is basically we have to consider the visual as a type of information. It's a social type as opposed to a factual type, but um, more on that later. So let's go. These are just some um, experimental stimuli from studies I did. And I took 9-11 in the footage of Bush immediately after. And this is um, what I call on, on the run. Uh, this was at the, I think, Louisiana Barksdale Air Force Base. He surfaced after landing on Air Force One. He thought he might have been uh, personally under attack, very um, low potency display. By the time he gets to Congress and is dressed 11 days later, the threat seems like it has at least passed or it has subsided and figured everything out, but he's suddenly uh, much more potent in his uh, commentary. So viewers respond to this, and they respond to a high potency display in news that's slightly less in intensity with less anxiety. So if you're trying to calm the populace, um, you know, you want to be on the right side, not on the left side. And so there's a lot of, you know, what social psychologists call generalized anxiety in those uh, days and moments um, after, the, uh, after the attacks. And what the leader does matters. And how they um, communicate non-verbally uh, has consequence. And this is why journalists and other elites and, you know, everybody from, <clears throat> I don't know, probably Rush Limbaugh to uh, Rudy Giuliani was saying, where's the president? Where's the president? We have to see him. Where's the president? And if you look in the reporting from 9-12-01, that's a big thing, is that George Bush seemed to disappear. Well, there was a credible threat against Air Force One, but there was a call for it. Okay, so anyway, um, you made a lot of uh, evaluations, and viewers do, whether they're aware of it or not. Okay, let's move forward. Okay, so this is back to the, to the HD 24-hour uh, news cycle argument. And also, we have to consider the tendency of news, particularly cable news, to focus on dramatic situations, and if there is good video, to repeat it over and over and over. So that would amplify some of these effects that you can find in experimental research. Um, you know, the more exposures, the more times you see it. Uh, even if people don't like it on a, on a normative level. Um, okay, let's go forward. And so here's an interesting uh, line. Think about what you're getting from Howard Dean there. And some people think that's fine. I, I did some focus groups up from Vermont, and they said, I, I met Howard Dean, and you know, he's not crazy. He wouldn't go off the handle. Um, but you know, we're talking about general tendencies uh, you know, among the electorate, and certainly among the elites. But his, his fortunes were already winning. Anyway, the, the lower picture is of kind of a typical radar image of a weather system, nobody would doubt that the weather system contains information. That's an important news graphic and what 
that we see almost every single day. And one that we seek out. We want to know that information. And my argument is you can kind of equate these two things in terms of their information value. They don't say the same thing, but they're telling us things, even though they don't use word. So like radar images of, of clear weather patterns or incoming storms, news can serve as a reliable, or visuals can serve as a reliable uh, form of information. Okay? Sometimes they're not reliable, and this is what Stahl was trying to say, when particularly persuasive or telegenic candidates try to um, convince us of something they're not. You know, there's, there's manipulation. Uh, or in, if ineffective communicators try to do something, they may ge unintentionally generate doubt like Howard Dean did because it just wasn't performing that role very effectively. Yeah. So I actually uh, worked on a big campaign in Iowa. I was in the room. Oh, you were, you were in the room during this. Interesting. Um, and we didn't know that that happened. Right, until so you were there. Yeah. Later the next day. Yeah. Because nobody, there were like 3,000 people in that room. And he was screaming to try and be heard over everybody. But nobody could hear a word he was saying. Yeah. The, um, the reason that the screen existed was because he, there was a unidirectional light on it. Yeah. And so that picked it up, but not pick, didn't pick up the crowd noise. Yeah. So, this is a, so this was a context where really the key was actually the, the audio, and not, and, and not just the audio, but the audio specifically removing yeah. itself from, from the, the context yeah. of the setting. Uh, it, know, it, it was already over. It was very interesting to see the vehemence with which that was reported. Like it was on ESPN the next day. Oh, yeah, 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 no, there was a feeding frenzy about it. And, and, I, and I've got the video, and, and I show it with the sound off. And what he does is he evidences signs of aggression. And if you, if you look at um, how to measure um, you know, display behavior, it's from behavioral biology, it, that especially in primates, before primates, there's uh, certain tendencies with the teeth and with facial musculature and showing your kind of thing, as opposed to smiling. When you're smiling, you kind of show different teeth. And so he's looking very aggressive. He's kind of smiling here, but being aggressive. But if you look at it too, there's, there's clear signs of, um, of anger and whatnot. But that's another uh, uh, comment about our media era, which is you have to assume everything now is, is close up and in high definition with the mic on. And, and, and politicians get caught all the time, not, not a that. Yeah? Uh, I'm wondering about the gender of all this. All the examples you've shown so far have been men. Right. And if it's evolutionary, uh, does that mean we see leaders as ma male? And that, and that, and you're using words like potency and so on, is it, how gendered is this? Right, well the potency is a reference to an emotional dimension also called dominance, but that seems to have a male connotation as well. Um, one of my, one of the ways I'm elaborating this is, is memorable moments, and so I'm showing people different episodes, and one of them is the Hillary Clinton kind of emotional moment in Trump, New Hampshire, but also when Rick Lazio in 2000, like, confronted her with a piece of paper he wanted to sign, he wanted her to sign an agreement about soft money advertising. And it's, I don't, I don't necessarily assume that the audience thinks a leader has to be but at least with presidential candidates, for the most part, they, they tend to be male. And the literature talks about leadership in a way that might be perceived as, as gendered, but I haven't looked at that in, in particular. Um, but, you know, male and females equally uh, exhibit facial displays that have consequence, absolutely. And I think if, regardless of gender, if you're in a leadership position right now as Secretary of State, um, that has to be paid attention to as well. And if you don't have good face control and face management, that's going to make people uneasy, particularly if the stakes are high. And so, you know, it wouldn't be 9-11 now, but it might be um, negotiations over nukes in Iran or something. You know, she came out doing a Dean-style rally. That wouldn't go over well. Anyway, let's move forward on that. So kind of one of the uh, classic episodes to um, um, start 
Chris might have won at least the first debate on the basis of uh, radio listeners. And that kind of speaks to uh, <coughs> some of the difference here. And one of my other uh, projects as well, the memorable moments, is to, to see if viewers actually pick up on what um, Nixon was doing here. And did Kennedy really look that good? Or was it, you know, Nixon's kind of, uh, he was coming out of the hospital and uh, he was sweating and things like this. <coughs> but um, one point I do want to emphasize is that, you know, the use of language requires an incredible amount of learning that we can't necessarily expect the mass audience to have. I think it's, it's, it's a very necessary goal to educate and you know, promote literacy to the extent that we can. But we should also recognize there's different kinds of literacies. So visual literacy uh, really means accepting that people may be learning uh, through images. And so there, there's something important there. And it goes against, you know, we kind of inherit a legacy of Gutenberg and the printing press and McLuhan made strong arguments about that but also um, just an essential kind of orientation or bias in Western philosophy is that you know, thinking takes primacy over other forms of human experience, particularly the passionate forms. And you know, the visuals are almost not talked about, but are kind of associated with emotionals and, and, and passion. So let's go forward and you know, go ahead. OK, so let's get down to the study here. And first of all, just some definitions sound bites and image bites. Image bites are defined as distinct segments where candidates are seen but not necessarily heard. There's different types of them. You might have an action shot of somebody walking around, walking down, um, uh, I don't know, an airplane um, kind of steps or at a rally or engaging with a uh, the crowd. There's sound ups where you can't hear them to begin with and at the very end of the shot you might hear a small comment but most of the time um, they're kind of muffled so it's primarily image. And then there's lip flap, which is a funny way of saying when somebody's talking, but the journalist's narration is over them, uh, we call that lip flap. And it's considered very unflattering. Um, and we would call it a visual form bias. A sound bite, on the other hand, is when you see them and hear them. And uh, there's another kind of sound bite, which if we think of radio actualities, you don't hear it, but you see the person. So in television, you can have a soft cut of somebody who's speaking before they're shown. And so a sound bite may actually start before you actually see the person. It, when, if you analyze television news very carefully, you, you notice these things um, come up. And we um, you know, point out that most of the research on television is done as if it was a radio transcript or a newspaper article. And the text is there, the transcripts are available on LexisNexis, and people will cut and paste those things, and you can run computer programs and do large scale analysis. And are you really studying television? I'd say no. I'd say you're studying the television audio, but you're not studying, for our money, what is the primary information source and, and value of the media. So let's go forward. We can find all kinds of studies that, that do that. OK, so uh, our content analysis, which the book is based on, um, starts in 92 and goes every general election to 04. We've got the 2008 tapes, and we're starting to analyze those as well. We put together composite weeks. so. Um, we recorded a network newscast, broadcast network, the old dying networks, as people say, but still have the largest concentration of viewers on a nightly basis. So ABC, CBS, and NBC. We didn't look at Fox. We didn't look at the cable um, news channels. We just kept it uh, to those three. And we took a randomly selected network every night of the week. So Monday through Friday, randomly selected network. That's what we mean by composite week. It's a technique that others have done, like uh, Dan Allen. There was a total over the four years of 178 newscasts, 437 campaign stories, da da da. There was about two and a half stories per newscast, total amount of coverage. Um, the unit of analysis, in other words, what we looked at and measured, was the newscast overall, uh, the individual story, and then individual candidates. It was very labor intensive, which is why most people don't do it. And this took the help of two trained graduate assistants, with um, both with the media background, and it took several years to collect this data. We started on this project in about 01, um, and for whatever reason, finally came together. Okay, let's go forward. Now, here's some interesting uh, trends in data. So, average sound bite length, according to our data and others, uh, has been decreasing, particularly from the late 60s when it started out, not started, but when it first got documented, being about 40 seconds on average, down 
to uh, about 10 seconds by 1988, was down to 9 seconds, 9.2 in 1992, and down to under 8 seconds in 2004. And a lot of sources um, talk about this, and of course there's a lot of concern uh, about that. What we found, though, is if you look at the image byte from the candidate shown but not necessarily heard, that this seems to be increasing. So the um, the circular um, uh, line up there is showing, oh, I'm sorry, the top line with the squares is showing uh, image byte total duration per story. So sometimes image bytes are real short, it might be a second, or might, maybe sometimes they're five seconds, or maybe sometimes they're 10 seconds. You can recognize a face within a matter of about 1 20th of a second. So two seconds of somebody's face gives you a clear picture of what they're doing. And whether they look well, whether they're sick, whether they're healthy, whether they're not. I can show you pictures of Steve Jobs before, you know, when he was healthy versus when um, he had cancer and treatment. And you would know very quickly, certainly in less than a second, which one was the healthy one and which one was not. So you get a lot of information just that way. Um, anyway, image bite time is increasing. Sound bite time is decreasing. What I'm showing you in the, the bottom line is, is the total amount of sound bites. So not the average, but the total. And a um, quick question. Yes. Does it matter in terms of the duration then? No, not that much. Well, that, you know, some of the data we are talking about, I know that Gary has been doing some analysis of video surrogates, right, Cap? Mm -hmm. Looking at it in terms of uh, five seconds, I think. Is that, is that what you guys are doing? That's what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
kind of in a more favorable position with the electorate, or it can hurt you, or come back and be used against you. So let's go to the next one. And so maybe the most famous soundbite was George Bush, George H.W. Bush's, read my lips, no new taxes, in the, uh, I think it was the 88 um, Republican National Convention. And that came back and got replayed over and over and over. And people seemed to understand that by passing a tax bill, he was breaking a promise. This doesn't even take eight, eight seconds to say. Now, it's truncated information, but it's substantive nonetheless. So what we did was we looked at what were the different categories of content. We divided it and assessed there was four basic categories plus a random or other category. They were either attacks on opponents, defenses, uh, defensive statements against attacks, uh, issue uh, pronouncements, and rally the troops, get out the vote, uh, vote for me, enthusiasm. If you look at um, attack and issue, the black and white lines up there, you can see that takes up the vast majority of soundbite content. The thing about attacks are, because candidates want to avoid libel and slander, and they don't just engage in pure character assault, although indirectly they might, that they tend to be issue focused. And content analyses of ads have shown the most negative ads have the most inf issue information on them, because people don't want to be sued for just attacking somebody without a foundation. So our point is, again, this is truncated politics and, and may not be normatively desirable, but if you accept that there is some information content in soundbites, most of the soundbite content has issue focus. So nobody had done that before, um, but we can say that now. Okay, let's go forward. Which brings us to uh, facial displays and going back to visual content, and go ahead and put all that up. If you look at, um, I got really interested in behavioral kind of categories of different facial displays. And candidates are constantly exhibiting these, and some are better than others. And Reagan, we could say, was a, um, the great communicator, I don't know if I buy that, but certainly was very effective at conveying happiness and reassurance at a time when we kind of seemed to need it in the early 80s in the midst of the recession and not feeling um, really good about some foreign policy what happiness reassurance does is that it invites bonding with whoever's viewing you. This is uh, developed out of small group behavior, but now it's projected to millions and potentially millions around the world. And it, it also uh, projects uh, compassion. Uh, on the other hand, you have anger threat, which is um, characteristic of challengers, by the way, or of, of threats and, and people you don't want to and then fear evasion, which actually signals that I'm not really suited for leadership because I can't deal with you directly or I can't handle the issue or the situation. And that was the problem with the core, um, that, that core image. And so candidates routinely uh, project these signals, whether intentionally or not. I would say a trained actor did it intentionally. So a natural communicator like Bill Clinton, probably intentionally, or at least that was just uh, Obama probably is aware when he's projecting certain um, types of displays. Um, someone like George W. Bush, John McCain, not known for their nonverbal effectiveness, um, they might not have been as aware. And, and it might have been more varied, or there's an interesting tenant, uh, uh, phenomenon in the literature called leakage. Leakage happens when you're trying to be happy but you're showing signs of fear, or you're trying, you're, um, trying to project confidence but you're actually angry angry or you might be afraid. And so leakage indicates a kind of a, uh, a mixed or a split uh, kind of motions and people are real good at detecting this. It's not the same thing as lying. It's just that something's not homogenous about your display. Therefore, it's less than completely um, acceptable. Okay, now let's go forward. So here's some examples. And happiness reassurance from Clinton in 92 and Gore in 2000. Let's go forward. More. Okay, then we get to anger threat, and you start to see uh, fixed eye stare, though you can't see it, the, the uh, resolution, but he's pointing, that's, you know, kind of in your face, gesturing. There's a, there's a, uh, the stare is real important to anger. Um, and you can see that in Bush's uh, expression, showing bearing of lower teeth is also characteristic of 
stuff you don't think about until you actually look at it real carefully. Okay, go for it. And George Gates, oops, go back one. George Gates studied with so father and son angry. Okay. Not all. Fear of Asian is harder to <laughs> find and less apparent on uh, television, but you can find it. And um, so when you have when you have this kind of side to side motion or downward eye gaze, generally evasive. Surprise can be a, uh, a low level sign of fear. Let's go forward. Uh, his evasion uh, push and even carries kind of looking sheep of stairs right after he was criticized. Um, and, you know, if he was in the, the Bill Clinton or Barack Obama school, he would have either kept a neutral face or he would have smiled as if he on the stage regardless of what was being said. <laughs> uh, which tends to be very important. Walter Mondale um, was really bad at being um, at managing his face when Reagan was speaking during the '84 debates. And he would laugh too much, uh, or he would show way too much reactiveness. Uh, and I think that hurt. Let's go forward. Were they doing split screen at that point? Mm, no, but there were. There was a camera off to the side once where Reagan told a joke about his age. And Mondale couldn't control his laugh. So the same shot, but on the side. Right. Yeah. And smile. Because I noticed that there was. Yeah, nowadays. Now. Oh, yeah. So the kids can watch that. Okay, put up the text. I hope I'm doing okay on time. Let's kind of go forward. But what you find is the uh, the type of display will vary by interview setting. So you can take speeches versus interviews. In, and we divide this to agonic, which is the negative stuff, and hedonic, which is the positive stuff. Um, there's no diff difference between anger, threat, fear, evasion on uh, the setting, but there is or the positive uh, displays. And candidates tend to be uh, more happy and reassuring in interview settings than in speeches. So if your goal is to bond with the electorate, and that's, that's your strategic uh, goal at the moment, you should schedule a, a lot of interviews. Um, you know, Obama did this recently, trying to kind of personalize the healthcare debate by appearing on several interview shows. Chances are he evidenced a lot more uh, happiness reassurance than he would have in speeches. Um, Okay, so yeah, we can go, and that, that plays out in terms of tone and facial display, that's what we're saying here. Okay, let's go forward. And then we looked at it by front runners versus trailing candidates. And, and you can put up all the text. The, um, <coughs> the general assumption and hypothesis is that challengers are going to be more aggressive, it turns out they are. Now challengers uh, running for office are in a dilemma. On the one hand, they do have to um, you know, at least confront or question the leader, but ideally you do it in such a way that it doesn't make you come off as angry or hostile or, uh, you know, a time bomb waiting to become really angry. And that was McCain's, one of the kind of, um, you know, implied concerns about McCain. What we found in our data was that, in fact, uh, trailing candidates are, do display more anger threat than, than front runners. To be a leader is essentially to be a happy warrior. It's a phrase that's kind of thrown out. It seems to be borne out by a news curve. Okay, let's go forward. And then we looked at it in terms of debate, winners and losers, thinking that the winner would evidence more happiness, reassurance as being the person kind of in charge at the moment, and the loser would um, evidence more either fear evasion uh, or other signs of secondary status, such as uh, threats, and that seems to hold up. So <coughs> losers have less happy face and more angry or evasive. And then we looked at it by uh, campaign stage. So I mean, you know, this data collection was very intensive, but once you have it, it's very, you can slice and dice it in lots of different interesting ways. So we broke up the uh, campaign into three stages. This has been done by other researchers before the debates, during the debate period, and in the final stretch. And <clears throat> the prediction was that the um, early uh, campaign stages were going to be more challenging and aggressive than the later campaign stages. When the goal is really just to try to, um, uh, you know, rally your core supporters and get people out to vote, and this it kind of bears this out. So, the um, the round circles are the amount of hedonic displays, and they're kind of um, this happiness reassurance, kind of standard or not moving between the early and debate phase, but definitely increase in the uh, later stage. Uh, the the anger threat. In the small extent, fear of Asia goes up from um, the early part of the general election.
are used to describe somebody? Or what issue are they associated with? Or you know, what's their narrative uh, kind of peg that we're going to just label on them over and over and over? And we said, why not visual? Why not look for trends in um, television visual and see if we can interpret these as frames? And I think um, we can. And, and where you get this, you derive it from other work that's related to this. And one of the places we look for elements of um, our frames was in the ideal candidate literature. Judith Prince done a little bit on that. Um, you also have, if you can go forward with the text, you've also got um, you know, narratives that emerge, whether from news coverage or uh, campaign lore about certain candidates. Um, and there's also uh, in there some degree of, of uh, public or, or citizen expectation. And so frames could be verbal narratives, sure, but we also think news visual. So one of the frames, we, we identif identified three basic frames. We didn't want to get too fancy to begin with, but the populist frame, which certainly has been talked about in relation to the healthcare debate. Um, you know, Sarah Palin's trying to kind of ride the populist uh, uproar, right, about big government. Um, we also identified an ideal candidate frame, which you can think of kind of Kennedy-esque or FDR, or somebody who, um, you know, epitomized leadership having um, a great kind of style. Uh, Clinton, to some extent, seemed to fit that. Obama, to some extent, uh, seemed to fit that. And then we have the unfortunate third frame of the sure loser. And in some general elections, certainly in primary elections, there are losers before the campaign even starts, and television coverage really reinforces this. And certainly it happens in general elections, and it happened with Bob Dole in 96, and after a certain point, it happened with So anyway, these are uh, frames that are not only uh, kind of suggested by journalists or uh, sometimes citizens or part of campaign lore, but also actively promoted by campaign handlers. So Bob Schrum on the Democratic side kept trying to fit his candidates in uh, Gore and then Kerry into a populist suit. With Bush, it might work. You can sit on the back and pick up truck, have a Coke, and put your cowboy hat on. It doesn't look too unnatural. With Kerry walking around in camo with the thumbs up and the rifle at his side, there's a little inconsistency or something. Okay, and what we what we um, what we identified was two dimensions of populism: mass appeal and then ordinariness. So let's go forward. Um, and these are some of the components of mass appeal: you know, large audiences, proving audiences, crowd interaction, celebrities. Ordinary was casual dress. Or what ordinary? Hang around with ordinary people, shirt sleeves instead of a suit, so forth. Here's mass appeal. So these are shots. These may, uh, usually they're image bites. Um, the journalist is talking over them. They're contextualized, but you can see candidates with celebrities, candidates with lots of people, uh, candidates seeming to be, um, you know, adored or at least very um, heavily attended to. Then you have ordinariness. Hey, I'm just out for a jog like anybody else on a Saturday. Um, at least he doesn't have shorts on, right? Harry wearing a barn coat. I, I, another another Shrum uh, ill-advised move. And you never saw Obama in a barn coat. You saw him in a bowling alley and a bar maybe once. It didn't go over very well. And thankfully, they only did it once if, if you're a Obama supporter. Um, and you know, this, this works for that mix. Let's go forward. Then another frame we looked at was the ideal candidate. We divided this into um, uh, two categories because the data seemed to suggest it. The, the shots and the images and the content that we were looking at seemed to suggest a, um, a distinction here, and as well as the, li uh, the literature. So there's certainly a, you know, kind of commander in chief or statesman um, type of presentation that involves the suit, that involves, you know, going to Berlin and making a world speech before you're uh, elected, where you're also visually linked, uh, not just to, not this time to common people, but to elites and politicians and other important, um, uh, you know, world leaders, might be patriotic symbols to reinforce, um, you know, your kind of uh, Americanness. And then some of the grandeur aspects of, you know,
team had a uh, kind of a fake presidential seal. You know, it's designed to kind of provoke this statesman thing. Then you have the compassionate leader, and this is where we put babies, right? They got they they show up all the time. It's a candidate, and you're going to have to deal with them. Uh, so visually linked to, to children, family, uh, affinity with supporters, and religious symbols, we put under the uh, compassionate leader uh, dimension. So let's go forward. And let's see. We've got the paraphernalia and um, kind of signs of uh, importance to greater or lesser extent. Visually linked with other leads, Bush and Schwarzenegger, Bob Elizabeth Dole, Well, 